Dave Anderson here with the Fisherman Magazine. It's February 29th. These are your headlines. Spring is trying to spring. You know, the, um, the largemouth bass bite took a strong step forward this week. We're still learning about great trout fishing pretty much across the entire region. A lot of nice fish still coming through the ice up north and way out west. And don't forget, if you live in Rhode Island, your freshwater fishing license expires today. Stay tuned for all that and more on this week's New England Fishing Forecast. Fishing News is sponsored by these fine partners. Before we begin, we've got a few news items for you guys. The first one comes to us from Mass Marine Fisheries. They are looking for observers to go out and conduct the MRIP survey. So you're going to be going to boat ramps and popular fishing destinations and talking to anglers and basically surveying them for what they caught and you know what they kept, what they the sizes of the fish, all the different data points that you can think of pretty much. And this goes into the MRIP system, which is basically what fisheries managers use to inform all of the decisions that they make on regulations and uh, seasons and all that stuff. So it's a pretty important job, and um, it's great for anyone who loves to be around the water all the time. Great for anyone who loves to talk fishing and uh, you know considers themselves a people person. Also, it would be a great summer job for uh, people home from college, and um, you yeah. know. Good job for anybody who's looking for uh, just looking for work. So uh, we'll put the uh, link up here on the screen and probably something down in the notes as well, uh, so you guys can click through if you want to uh, if you want to apply. One thing I did see is that they're going to give uh, preferential treatment to the people who apply first, and they're really hoping that um, they're going to get some applications by tomorrow, March first. So if this is something that sounds particularly good to you, I would. You know, hit pause right now and uh, and go fill out the form so you can get yourself in line. Uh, next thing, of course, we talked about in the intro a little bit, but we have some regulatory stuff to talk about. And first thing is, of course, Rhode Island is the only state that doesn't that whose freshwater license doesn't expire on the first of the year. So your freshwater license in Rhode Island expires today, the 29th of February. Uh, so don't mess that up. You know, you don't want to go out there and you know get yourself in trouble because you forgot. Uh, so consider this, you know, your warning, me telling you. Um, and this also coincides with the closure of trout season in Rhode Island. So if you wanted to catch a couple more trout before opening day, you got to do it now. you got to, you know, finish watching the video and head out and go do it. Um, but, you know, Rhode Island is the only state in southern New England that has a closed trout season as well. So you're going to have, you know, from March 1st till the second Saturday in April at 6 a.m. is going to be closed. And that also means that any place, any pond with the, uh, you know, trout stocked water sign is off limits to all fishing. You can't go fishing for largemouth or sunfish or anything. You, that, those waters are sacred ground right now and off limits. And um, you don't want to get caught fishing in there. Uh, so that's that half of it. And then in Connecticut, we also have the closure of the harvest season as of tomorrow. So today's your last day to harvest the trout in Connecticut. Uh, there's a couple of bodies of water that have their own special regulations. So um, you may want to check the deep website for that. But by and large, across the board, um, trout fishing is still open in Connecticut. So you can fish right through to opening day. And I know stocking efforts are going to ramp up now, um, but all trout caught need to be released until opening day. So uh, those are the two little bits of important information I want to make sure I relay to you guys uh, right now. And the next thing is going to be another installment of Jenny Ackerman's Open Boat. Take it away, Jenny. Hey everyone, welcome back to this week's Open Boat. Now we are still here in the lab because we're continuing our winter workbench series. 
and today we're going to be talking about a very important factor that comes into rod building, reel seat selection. Now, of course, there's a ton of different options you can choose when picking a reel seat. Today, I'm gonna to give you three options to the best reel seats that you have available on the market, specifically available on Angler's Resource. Now, these three are all Fuji reel seats, and each of them work well for different rods you wanna choose and different applications. It depends on if you want a pretty sleek looking reel seat or ones that have colored inserts. Angler's Resource has it all. So starting off, I'm going to be talking about the Fuji DPS Deluxe. This is probably the most popular reel seat on the market. It's very common, you can see it all over the place on a ton of custom spec rods in your local tackle shop, all over the place. It's an excellent reel seat. It can be used for both casting and spinning, and it comes in many sizes to fit just about any rod or reel. So you can't beat that option. Next up is the Fuji TCH reel seat. This thing is lightweight, carbon fiber. It is super sleek. It's nice and comfortable in your hand, even just holding it without a rod on it. It has a titanium enforced hood. So that also adds to that lightweight feature. And it has ribs. I don't know if we can see this here. Oh yeah, you can. It's got ribs inside the tube to create an incredibly strong epoxy glue bond to the blank. And that's a major important thing. If you're building your own rods, you want to make sure that you have enough epoxy on that reel seat so you don't have the reel seat and spinning on your blank as you're bringing in a fish. So maximum amount of glue and coverage on a reel seat is very important. Last up, we have the Fuji TVS and you can see my eye through there. That is actually a compartment to fit different Fuji trim parts and you can add different colored ones. They're all available on Angler's Resource. They're all Fuji compatible, perfect trim parts and just adds a little bit of color. Like they have one that's black and red in case you have guide wraps that are all black with a red trim band. There's a ton of different colored options. So it just adds a nice little bit of flair to your real seat. Like I said about all the other ones, it's super comfortable in your hand and it has a dual lock reel system on here. So that dual lock holds that reel in very firmly. So all three of those reel seats are excellent options and you can find them all on Angler's Resource. So make sure to check them out and I'll catch you on next week's Open Boat. Last thing of course is the giveaway which is ongoing and it's been a slow trickle lately. You know, the weather's been kind of up and down. Um, starting to see a little bit more activity now though, starting to see a few more photos coming in. There is definitely no clear winner at this point and um, you know I am giving away this thing which I think is a pretty cool plug. You know, I'll put a picture up on the screen but there it is. Uh, Connecticut Yankee dual action swimmer made by yours truly and um, you know, you'll definitely be one of the only people on the coast throwing that plug right now so uh, who knows could be a secret weapon but by now you guys know the drill uh, you've got to send your pictures in to me at deanderson at the .com or text them to the number on the screen and just tell me the details you know tell me who you are tell me about where you caught it you know tell me whatever the story is behind it uh, but beyond that it doesn't matter to me as long as it was caught in a rod and reel and it was caught within the last few months um, it's eligible and you know, it doesn't matter if you caught it down in Florida, if you caught it in your backyard, if you caught it off your paddleboard, I don't care. Um, it just has to be a picture that shows you holding your fish and um, it has all those pertinent details attached. We'll get you entered in the contest. We're going to wrap this one up on April 24th, so um, you got plenty of time to get those photos in. We'll see who wins. Moving over into the reports now, let's start things off with the freshwater synopsis like we usually do during the wintertime. And this has been a very good week for freshwater fishing. Um, we had this major system come through Tuesday night into Wednesday and then spilling over into Thursday. A lot of high wind, we had dueling fronts coming through. Uh, you know, we went from 50 degrees to 30 something degrees, you know, and that's all those things combined together to create, you know, for the lack of a better term, a perfect storm of, um, 
of a fishing scenario. When I saw that coming together, you know, I said to myself, I definitely have to fish Wednesday afternoon and uh, no, Tuesday afternoon. And so I did, you know, I had it out for a few hours and uh, threw jerk baits around and it was everything I thought it would be. You know, fish were stacked up on structure, a lot of competitive feeding, so a lot of, a lot of spots where you're getting three, four, five, six, seven fish, you know, in 15 minutes of casting and a lot of competitive action. So fish, you know, fighting over the bait almost and a lot of hard hitting fish. Um, the only thing that was missing yesterday was a true giant, you know, uh, had fish up into the, you know, up into the three pound range, which is definitely a solid fish, but, uh, you know, I was hoping for that five plus and that didn't happen yesterday. Um, but talking to other guys, talking to Jeff Sullivan, talking to my friend, Mike Lucini, uh, a lot of guys are doing very well right now on largemouth bass. This whole week has been good. Um, looks, you know, it's probably going to be a little off coming into the weekend, but, um, then we've got, you know, we've got another warm up, and then we've got a whole bunch of other sort of unstable weather coming. So um, it's going to be lots of opportunity to uh, to cash in on that largemouth bite. So that's something that you guys can definitely uh, keep a def or definitely should keep an eye on. We've been talking about this for a few weeks. This spills over into February, spills over into April, February, spills over into March and April. Um, so you know, it's a it's a tried and true method of prioritizing your fishing during these months and it's definitely something you don't want to uh, miss out on and it does it's not just largemouth bass it, that it works for i mean it works for pike it works for pickerel it works for trout and trout can be very good uh, i was talking to jeff sullivan today he was out in the sloppy weather and uh doing well on salmon in a rhode island pond so you know all different species of fish just have this instinct to feed ahead of ahead of and during one of these crazy weather events that we have at this time of the year and uh, it's definitely something you don't want to miss Moving over to the regional reports now, um, still a lot of safe ice to the north, and the guys that are getting out there are still doing very well. Uh, I've seen some nice salmon coming through the ice up in Maine, seen some nice largemouth bass coming through the ice up in Maine, and uh, checked in with Evan Camoen. He had his biggest smallmouth ever uh, through the Maine ice this week. So, um, you know, probably a, a result of this weather system that we had also just firing up the bite under the ice. Uh, it's also a great time to pike fish, you know, when we have these things coming through. So uh, the ice fishing has been really good where the ice is safe. That's basically Western Mass, upstate New York, you know, all through Vermont, New Hampshire, and into Maine. Anywhere it seems east of, like, Springfield is definitely not okay. Um, so you're definitely going to want to be very careful if you're going to get on any ice that's that doesn't hardly have people on it. Um, so definitely uh, proceed with caution. This is a dangerous time of year for ice fishing, but there is still ice fishing taking place. As we drop down into Massachusetts, let's check in first with James Jukes. Good morning, everyone. Just checking a couple of local trout ponds up here. Yep, and there's still ice. Um, it's very thin though, so <laughs> don't go out on the ice. But Reports over the weekend were great. The fishing was great. Uh, there was some pike caught in the river. Uh, no carp action though. Uh, but there was plenty of bass action and panfish all over the place in a bunch of local ponds. Uh, and only a short ride north, uh, about an hour. And there was plenty of ice uh, lots of guys catching plenty of fish through the ice, but this weather this week is going to really destroy it, unless you're willing to drive really far north. Uh, so the fishing was really good, so that's that's that. Uh, I did hear a local striper guy had one uh, locally. Uh, pretty sure the Boston guys got out and found some holdovers over the weekend as well so that's good uh, I'm sure in another couple of weeks they'll start the trout stocking up here and then by the end of next month we should be getting close to shad fishing and serious trout so we'll keep an eye out for that and just keep chugging along look for those uh, little weather breaks get out in the water Alrighty, Dave. 
For more than 20 years, anglers everywhere have come to know one thing, that nothing says no to fish bites. Now let's head out west and talk about some of that ice fishing with Roy Leva. I officially called uh, my 2024 ice fishing season um, after Tuesday's trip. Uh, I went from 11 inches to about 7 inches uh, by the afternoon. Uh, ice wasn't looking that great. Maybe 3 or 4 inches of water on top with all the warm weather. I was in a t-shirt. Um, yeah, it's time to, to, just, to just give up. Uh, good, good thing is that uh, it's kind of like spring out here. And for the next couple of weeks out here in Western Mass, we've really got some really good warm temperatures. So that should get a lot of things going. Uh, you know, if carp, trout, uh, you know, pike continue to pike fish if I want to. Uh, obviously all the fresh water, I mean, just anything fresh water out here, uh, even some holdover stripers in some of the rivers. Um, you know, it's, it's fair game now. So spring is here. If you didn't get to go out ice fishing this year, um, sorry, uh, you're gonna have to wait till next season. Um, if not, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's trout mode. Those trucks should be rolling soon. I'll keep you guys posted. Um, I haven't gone out open water yet. I will this week, so I'll have a report uh, for you next week, see what's going on. Uh, I might continue to pike fish. Uh, I don't know, I'm just kind of, having didn't get enough, but uh, I know it's crazy me saying that, but I didn't get enough. So I finished off the year with over 130 pike this season, uh, which is a lot for, you know, the amount of ice that we had and the very little uh, options that I had to fish on. So uh, with that said, uh, I will catch you guys next week. Peace out, stay safe, stay off the ice. Not getting a lot of uh, reports out of Central Mass. Pretty much, it's got to be most of the bigger ponds right now are the only places that we're hearing about anyone doing any fishing. I haven't gotten a lot of reports this week. Hard to say why. Um, but a lot of the smaller places are still skimmed up or the edges are, you know, crunchy and just not fishable yet. Um, but, you know, as we get down closer to the Cape, uh, the bass fishing has been very, very good this week. Uh, fish are starting to click into pre-spawn mode out around the coast. Uh, we're also probably starting to maybe get a couple of scout herring into some of these herring ponds, which is also going to fire up some of these bigger fish. Um, but the jerkbait bite has been really good. I got this awesome picture from uh, my buddy Mike Bussini of his friend who doubled up on a jerkbait. I've never had that happen, be happen before to me, but that's pretty cool. Um, and the bite overall has been very good. I talked to numerous guys, numerous friends of mine that fish in the Cape, fish in interior southern Massachusetts, and uh, finding really good bites on jerk baits, jigs, and ned rigs. Uh, trout fishing on the Cape, you know, it's been good all month and it continued again this week. Uh, starting to see a little bit more action on lures. You know, the water's warmed up a degree or two, and that might just be kicking them into a new mode. Um, so you're seeing guys doing it with jerk baits and ned rigs and tubes and things like that. Um, I really have not heard much saltwater action at all. I know there's been some Sabiki rig mackerel pollock action on the east end, but I haven't heard anything new on that. Uh, so for now, I'm considering that in a holding pattern. But um, you know, if it's something you want to check out, it's been out more toward the Sandwich Marina and uh, off the bulkheads there. So um, that's where you can check if you want to try that out. And that's what I have for you guys in Massachusetts this week. Jumping over into Rhode Island now, uh, we'll start things off with an East Bay report from TJ Kopecki. Thanks, Steve. Hey guys, got a quick report for the uh, some of the East Bay here and a little bit of uh, southeast of Massachusetts. Uh, things are still a little slow. Uh, for granted, the water's cold, and you know we the covered a lot of the skim ice with this uh, the rain that we've had in the 50 degrees. Um, the freshwater bite in most of the local ponds around here, uh, I got a report that, uh, you know, the crappie fishing in both the Upper Warren Reservoir, which is in North Swansea, and the Milford Pond, which is behind Target, if any of you guys, you know, don't know where it is, has been pretty good. And guys are using soft plastics, uh, they're using the uh, gulp smelts on daubers, basic you know, stuff that I use myself, and I've, I've actually fished with a couple of these guys and shown them some of the techniques that I use, and now they use the same techniques. So, the fishing's been good for that. I haven't heard of any bass, though. I haven't caught any bass in any of these ponds yet. Uh, I know they're there, but that, like, the water is still in the 40s. So, it kind of brings me now 
to the tip of the week that we have for kind of like our area here, even though that the water is warming and we think that, we, you know, spring's coming, it's, you know, March 1st is typically the meteorological first day of spring for, for the weather guys, but, you know, we have to wait a little longer. But uh, the water is warming. There, there are transitions. There's heron starting to show up in, in some of these, you know, heron runs that are getting up into the fresh water. It's going to spark a bite with these, these bass. Uh, largemouth bass are very lazy right now. Uh, you don't want to fish small wiggly crankbaits, you know, that make a lot of action, a lot of noise. You basically want to slow your presentation down still. Keep it slow, keep it low. Uh, use stick baits, jerk baits, skinnier profiles. They're after a meal that's they don't have to expend a lot of energy to get so they can benefit from it longer if that makes sense. Um, try to fish in spots of the ponds where you think the water be the warmest. Uh, try to fish on non-cold, windy morning days. Um, it's better to fish with a warm breeze blowing. Um, there's, there's like a lot of factors. Try to fish the clear water. Because uh, if fish can see the bait coming from a while, they might be more influenced to feed on what your presentation is rather than if it was in like a, a dirty, muddy water. It doesn't work in the, in the winter time. And uh, I think a lot of us know that already. But hey, it's a good tip to remember. And I know spring is coming. So, and I know there's gonna be a lot of guys out. I mean, the weather next week, it looks a lot in the 50s, but it looks like there's a lot of rain coming. So there's gonna be some dirty stained water. Do your best if you're gonna fish next week to try and get into those cleaner water pots. And I, I think that you guys will have better luck. Uh, so for this week from the East Bay area, that's all I got for you. And uh, hopefully I'll have some better reports uh, next week. So uh, we'll, keep, we'll, we'll catch you next week in tight lines, guys. Now, as has been the case over these last few weeks, we're seeing the holdover striped bass action just sort of ratcheting up incrementally, just little steps at a time. Um, and again, this week, uh, we saw a more increase in action. We're starting to see the, the schools of fish moving now. Um, so there, I think that that's indicating that water temperatures are changing for the better. These fish are going to start to feed a little bit more. They're going to become a little bit more active. Um, guys that I talked to that fished uh, mostly caught, you know, really small fish. Um, but we're marking some good fish on the kayaks, so they are there, and uh, especially once we start to see some herring, and this is right around the time of year when we start to see them in a lot of these Rhode Island estuaries, uh, that should kick things into a new, a new gear and uh, start to see some of these bigger fish biting and also be able to target them uh, with some faster moving baits, you know, some, uh, some glide baits or like a magic swimmer or something like that. Um, this, those are great baits for this time of the year once the herring start to move. So uh, that's one thing you can start to put more concentration into. Other thing, of course, is the largemouth bass fishing, which has been good everywhere. Um, and as I, as we talked about a little bit, you know, I was out this week um, and did very well uh, over the weekend, and then again on Tuesday, just throwing jerk baits. I never even, I never even changed methods. I just thrown jerk baits at hard structure, and the uh, the action was exceptionally good. Uh, talked to Jeff Sullivan, he said the same. He said that he did very well um, throwing jerk baits and Ned rigs for largemouth and Rhode Island waters also. Uh, also, the trout fishing has been good, but don't forget, the uh, trout fishing is going to be closed as of the end of today. So if you want to get in on some of these trout and salmon, you're going to have to do it right away. Uh, just watch out for that white sign, you know, trout stocked waters. You do not want to be caught in there with a rod and reel uh, because uh, the game warden is not going to be nice to you, trust me. And um, outside of that, let's check in quickly now with Jeff Sullivan. He's got some stuff about some of the knots that he likes to tie. Thanks, Dave. Hey, guys, what's happening? It's Jeff back with another weekly video. This week, I'm going to talk to you guys about what knot I like to tie for my leader connections, and that's a uni to uni. So I'm going to be showing you guys how to tie, how I like to tie a uni to uni knot. Um, I like to use it for, you know, um, inshore fishing and freshwater fishing. Um, you know, it takes seconds to tie if you tie it as, you know, you tie 10, 12 of them, you know, in a day, 
you can tie it with your eyes closed, you know what I mean, if you're new to tying knots. Um, but yeah, it's very easy to tie, a very strong knot, and um, here we go. So I'm going to use 40-pound monofilament. You can use monofilament. You can use braid. You can use fluorocarbon. You can use um, lead core if you want to do lead core to fluorocarbon for your trolling your tubes. Um, you know, there's you can do line-to-line -line connections with anything with this knot. Um, but for main line and leader, I like to do it because I have, still have the characteristics of braid and I still I get the characteristics of the mono or fluorocarbon leader. So I get two two lines in one, which is it's sweet. Um, so therefore, so I like to take my braid. This is 65 pound depth hunter. I just had it laying around. You guys can see it better. It's colored and um, 40 pound mono. So what I like to do is I like to take both lines and I'll cross them. I'll simply just cross them. Um, I'll get myself some line here on both ends. So I have one tag on one end and one tag on the other. So I like to start on the mono or floral side first. Um, there's no rhyme or reason, that's just me and I've been doing this for years, so why change it? Um, so I, simply what I'm gonna do is I'm going to bring this, I'm gonna bring this mono up to my hand, my holding hand, my hand that's holding the lines there. See, I'm just, all I'm doing is just bringing this up. I'm making a loop. That's all I'm doing. So what I like to do here is I like to have enough tagging up top so I can make my wraps. I'm going to make five wraps, by the way. That's just the number I like to do with this uh, thicker leader material. Um, the thinner the line, the more wraps you can make. Um, so I like to make a bigger loop so I can stick my hands in there and make the wraps. So I'll make a little, a little bigger tag in. So I'm going to grab my, grab my loop. And I have over the two, both these lines right here, I'm gonna make the wraps away from me five times. Very easy. One, two, three, four, five. So now I'm gonna hold both these lines here and I'm gonna pull this tag in on the mono. Or if you're using floral fluorocarbon, you wanna pull that tag in. Don't cinch it down all the way yet, not yet. So just get it down so it's kind of snug, all right? And then for right now, you're all set with that. So you move over to the other side. You can leave this mono side alone for now. So you wanna move over to the other side. And I'm gonna make a loop here. See how I have a lot of line out? Sometimes that happens. You just cut back, just cut back to tag in. There's no big thing. This wants to cut, there it goes. So, so I'll make the loop, like I said, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna bring it I'm doing the same exact thing I did on the mono side. I'm gonna bring it back up to both lines at the top, right? I'm gonna make sure I have enough to make my wraps. The cool thing about braid is you can make more wraps because it's thinner in diameter. So I'm gonna do eight wraps. So I usually do eight wraps. So here we go. There's two lines at the top, braid loop on the bottom. I'm gonna wrap away from me eight times. One, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, right? So now I'm gonna hold these two, the two lines with my right hand, my off hand, and then I'm gonna pull this braid tag in. I'm gonna work it down. I'm gonna work it down. Work it down. See how it's coiling up right there? Perfect. All right, so now, that's done. So now you have one knot over here and one knot over here. I mean, I did them pretty far away just so you guys can see um, what I'm gonna do here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna expect this line. I'm gonna make sure there's no nips and nicks in it and uh, no frays, no anything, because right now what's gonna happen is these two are gonna meet up. These two knots are gonna meet up. Um, I'm gonna add tension. And um, I don't want heat. So friction on braid or friction on mono or fluoro, heat in general on your line, you don't want that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lubricate the line just so it doesn't heat up. I wish I had flavored line. That'd be pretty cool. Um, anyway, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull both ends here. Right? So now they're going to, so now they're closer together. I'll bring them bring them closer so you got you can see it now I'm gonna pull I'm gonna keep pulling I'm gonna keep pulling I'm gonna keep pulling 
and now I'm going to really pull tight. So you know you did it right when your braid turns a color, a darker opaque color. So I have this blue um, Depth Hunter. It's like dark blue on that side. And you can tell by the monos cinched down all the way. So that's a 100% line connection. So now you're 99% done with this knot. Just another look. You can see, I don't know if it's going to focus or not. But you can see how it's, it's cinched down. That ain't going anywhere. It's two knots fighting against each other. So the more tension you put on it, the more it's fighting against each other. So more it cinches down. So that's that's not going anywhere. So now what I'll do is I'll cut as close as I can with the tag ends. Like so. I just cut the mono. Now I'm going to cut the braid. I tie this knot all the time at the shop. And I tie it for me even on the boat, from shore, in the surf. This is the number one inshore not leader leader not all tie or the um freshwater not all tie for my leaders but right there it's an awesome knot guys all right same time next week thanks Connecticut now. Um, I'll remind you guys once again that harvest season for trout in Connecticut closes today. So if you wanted to take one home for the table, you're going to have to do it before it gets dark out today, um, or you're going to have to wait till opening day. Uh, just to reiterate, you can still target trout in almost all waters across the state. You just can't keep any until the second Saturday in April. So just keep that in mind. Um, some of the things that are going on in Connecticut right now, we're starting to see more guys targeting uh, the pike and panfish and things up inside the coves of the Connecticut River. A lot of guys doing it from shore. Saw some nice pike landed um, over the last yeah, last five or six days from some of these shore locations. Um, seeing some guys doing the, the crappy and the white perch thing. That's starting to fire up a little bit. So it's good to see that guys are getting out now on the Connecticut River and, uh, and making some things happen. The other thing is with the holdover striped bass activity percolating in, um, in Rhode Island waters, you're going to see that start to happen on the Connecticut River as well. For a little bit more on that, let's start things off with Rowan Blytle. Hey everybody, uh, definitely looking at a good pattern shift going back to kind of rainier weather. Uh, just got a good shot that got rid, of, got rid of pretty much all the snow here in the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, for a short time that's going to mean colder stream temperatures. Uh, so along with higher flows and uh, some murky water as a result of this runoff, expect water temperatures to be down a little bit, so fish activity is going to be down. Uh, but coming into the weekend, it uh, looks like showers in fairly warm weather, and that should be good for the fishing. Uh, that's always a good sign for early season pike. You can get some pretty good bites with those low pressure systems, especially with the warmer conditions. Uh, there's still snow up north. In New Hampshire and Vermont, that hasn't really started to melt enough uh, to bring up the river. So the Connecticut River is still at a pretty typical level. Uh, actually dropped quite a bit. Um, and all the tributaries are high, so the trout fishing is going to be slow, at least until next week. Uh, but with a consistent warm-up uh, in the forecast, things are looking up uh, towards some more spring-like fishing conditions soon. So... I suspect within the next couple of weeks the reports will change to be talking about smallmouth bass and uh, and crappie and things like that. But for the, for the time being, in what streams aren't super high, you should have fairly good trout fishing, especially uh, fishing swimming plugs and large streamers, things of that nature. And pan fishing in the coves and marinas should still be good uh, with the early season perch, uh, some crappies, and uh, big bluegills if you find them. While we're in the Connecticut River area, let's check in quickly with Captain Mike Roy from Real Cash Charters. For this week's forecast, I was supposed to be going down to Venice, Louisiana this weekend, but unfortunately that trip got canceled. The good news is it's going to be rescheduled to March 25th and I have four openings. So this is fishing for big bull reds. Venice, Louisiana is really known for their outstanding red fishery. And this is with Journey South Outfitters. They are 
a top-notch outfitter in Venice, Louisiana. It's fishing three days for bull reds, four nights of accommodation, includes open bar and food, and they do a great job with their Louisiana-style cooking. So highly recommend this trip. If you're interested and you want more details and pricing, just reach out to me. You can text, call, message me, email me for more information. It's going to be the week of March 25th. Now heading a little west, we'll stop in Westbrook, check in with Matt Stone at Black Hall Outfitters. What's up everyone, Matt here at Black Hall Outfitters in Westbrook with this week's fishing report. Tail end of February, heading into March here. Um, we have got some rain moving through over the next few days, um, kind of mixed with some funky temperature roller coaster action going on. Um, it's definitely going to change the flow rate, obviously, in our streams and things like that. Uh, I got out of trout fishing yesterday. Um, it was really great. A lot of good fish biting. Um, here in Connecticut, the stocking, uh, spring stocking has begun. Um, so you can keep an eye out for that stuff. That's always fun to kind of chase those fish down, um, get a bend in the rod in these months. Um, we're going to have definitely some holdover action still continuing. With days in the 50s here, um, you're definitely going to start to see, you know, maybe catch them on days where they're feeding. They feel that sun. Um, they're a little more active. Um, that's true of all fish right now on those kind of fake out spring days that aren't really spring quite yet, even though we desperately want it to be. Um, but yeah, there's bass eating jerk baits, nice slow pauses there. Um, you can do some deep jigging for crappie, yellow perch, things like that. If you can find those on the sounder or fish a hole or something like that. Slow crawl swim baits, um, all that kind of good stuff. And a uh, couple more months until uh, it warms up and we're all out there in our shorts and t-shirts bending those rods. Good luck out there. And then heading out west, you know, most of the guys that are that are fishing hard right now are fishing the Housatonic. Uh, the bite's probably going to fire up this week with, a, with all this runoff coming down. That tends to fire things up. So that's one place you can look at. Obviously, there's a lot of trout fishing, you know, from the Farmington to the Mill River to the Norwalk River and all places in between. Uh, so you have lots of opportunity there. And then, of course, even though I haven't gotten any concrete reports from Connecticut with the largemouth bass action being so good in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, I guarantee you, if you went out into some of the better spots in Connecticut and did, did what I was doing, throwing jerk baits, throwing jigs, throwing nets, um, you're going to get in on some good largemouth bass action. So, um, you know, don't neglect that. That's a really fun fishery, and this is one of the best times of year to do it. And to wrap things up in Connecticut, we'll check in now with Max Finch from Fisherman's World. Our trout streams are fishing well. You know, guys are throwing a lot of rooster tails, small jigs, you know, trout mannix on a float. The Mill River, Nauk River is fishing well. And then the Housatonic River for the striped bass. I've seen some nicer fish taken at night. Guys are upping their presentations like gravity tackles, eight inch paddle tail, you know, the sluggo nine inch, their seven and three quarters finesse fish are working well. During the daytime hours, I'm hearing a lot of lock jaw. Guys are scaling down in the day, you know, lighter fluorocarbon lines, four inch soft plastics, cinches sluggos. But, you know, the fish should really start getting active. We move into March and our water's warm. You know, spring is on its way. The daylight is getting longer. So everybody's getting the itch and getting ready to get their boat ready and get in the water. Thanks and good luck. That's what I have for you guys in reports this week. Hopefully it's going to inspire you to get out there. The weather's changing. The bite's changing. It's a great time to get out there and make it happen. Uh, it's also one of the times of year that feels like it goes by so fast. So you really want to make sure you make time to fish. If you're not a subscriber to The Fisherman, I highly recommend you head over to our website. That's thefisherman.com. It's going to give you enough free content to give you a full taste of what we offer. We cover all the fishing from Delaware up to Maine. We have travel stuff that reaches outside the region, and we cover all angling disciplines, whether you're a fly fisherman, a surf fisherman, you're an offshore guy, you're strictly a freshwater guy, you're in the kayak, you're in the belly boat, you're on the paddleboard. We've got it all covered. It's 30 bucks for the year, $29.99, $29.95. And for that, you're gonna get 12 paper issues sent to your house, and you're also gonna get 26 digital editions sent to your email during the season from April through November. It's the best 30 bucks you can spend in fishing. If you're not interested, even after all that, which would be hard to believe, at the very least, give us a like and subscribe here on YouTube and hit that little bell thing down there so you get a notification every time we post something new. Appreciate you guys for watching, and we'll see you next week.